welcome to Flory Models. Yes, it's just me. Literally, me, myself and I today. So that's why we're into the wrong camera. Good afternoon, welcome to Flory Models live show. Here we are on the 12th of May, 2020. And it's definitely gone quite quiet. There's not many people in the chat. I think a lot of people have gone, obviously, back to work. So uh, obviously now the lockdown is slightly being lifted right around the world. So we'll probably be calling it quit, so to speak, on these live shows. I know, a bit of a bummer, but obviously don't forget, we're still back. Me and Matt will do our Wednesday show as always. That'll be live and open. And we'll obviously be the one on um, uh, Wednesday night, sorry, Thursday night, the one we do at 7.30 right the way through on things like that. So really, today will be quite an interesting one. So I thought what we'd do is have a look at when I do my reviews. So one of the things is, obviously I've reviewed now hundreds. I wouldn't be surprised if we're not near the thousands of kits and items and various bits and pieces. So I thought what I would do to you is have a look at one of the kits I've got coming up and talk to you how I look at and doing a review and things like that at the end of the day. So I thought it'd be just a little bit interesting. So obviously when we're doing reviews and things like that, you see me sit here and go, here we go and all the rest of it. It is genuinely, I can honestly say, it is what it seems. I have never looked in the book in the box before, had a look at any of it or anything else like that. It is literally just a case of me first impressions of what I see from the kit. Okay, obviously you get a little bit of filters through. You get people saying, "Oh, it's amazing! You really ought to review this." Things like that, and obviously people who've built it will tell me, "Oh, I built that kit. It goes together really, really well." Or be careful, there's an area that doesn't fit on, or that's a bit of an issue you might want to look out for. And I will, of course, pass that on to you guys um, to obviously make your decision on buying the kit and everything else but it generally is that thing there's a reason I don't watch anybody else's reviews is purely because you get led you know literally if I was to watch somebody else do a review on a particular kit I'm going to sit there and think do you know what that's probably a good point even before I've looked at it. So you've almost been sort of, you know, led along to believe that there could be a fault with it. There might be something really fantastic about it or anything else. So I like to actually get a review in blind and look at it blind. And that then is a double-edged sword because I'm literally doing a review right in front of you, live, so to speak, as it's done. Obviously, I might miss something that's blindingly obvious, but I've literally just got five, ten minutes to review a kit. So that's my impressions of it. So that's when I get a lot of people and they'll say to me, oh, you know, you missed this. It's blindingly obvious. Why didn't you see it? Honestly, it's I'm looking at it as perhaps you would look peruse at it, perhaps if you were in a shop. And that's the difference between a reviewing of the kit parts than actually a video build. Yeah, video builds. I've done now, what, 150 of those now over the years. Um, built thousands of kits over the years and everything else like that. That's something different. These reviews I'm doing, it'd be no different from you going into a store, picking up the box, opening it up, having a quick look through it and seeing what you can see in there as well. Although I've got the privilege of doing it a little bit more in depth and I've got a bit more time you have in a shop. Purely because, let's face it, most of us now don't get the opportunity to go to a model shop and sit there and literally have a look at the parts and go through them all. You know, they're a bit of a dying breed um, and some shops don't even like you opening up the boxes. That's something we've always done at the PM store with me and Matt. We said we want it to be open. So if you want to look through the boxes, help yourself, you know, go and uh, sit down, get them on a desk, have a look at all the parts if you want to and go through it like that because that way you can make a better decision and obviously, you know, make your choices on what kit you want to get. So really, when I'm looking at this, so if I do this as like a run through and then I have to re-rivet this afterwards, literally you see it like I do, looking down in here just like this, all right? Then it's just a case of, I always like to have a look around the box so you guys obviously get a little bit of a look for it as well. Have to say, this is the first time I have seen this kit as well, all right? So what we've got down here is obviously the Armour Hobbies one, 170 second scale Hurricane. I've heard lots and lots of great things about this actual kit, but you know, never seen it myself, all right? Looks good, then obviously I usually give you your information on this one. The most important one obviously is the kit number. That way you can go off and find the kit yourself. So it's 70022 on this one. Okay, in the box itself we have one, and that is literally it, one screw full of bits just in here like this. Okay, and usual thing, it is a 
single bag, which again can be a little bit of a problem. Again, it's one of those things, I call it sprue rub. It's not so much of a problem here because it literally is one sprue and these parts here. But if you've got a situation with sprues going back to back and scratching, you can cause damage down in these. This is why I don't like to have single, technically, um, you know, uh, bags full of sprues rattling around each other. The other thing that can happen as well, a lot of them have got it, and this is a classic example, you've got long bits that stick down on the sprues and things like this. They can get in amongst your parts and end up snapping and damaging detail in here as well. So that's why I always say about, you know, yeah, I don't like it. It's got, you know, problems with it, you know, especially parts like these up here. They're obviously going to get snapped off, all right? We like to always have a look through the instructions first. Also, the reason for looking at the instructions first is it gives me an idea of what to look out for for parts on the actual um, sprues themselves, all right? So it might be things I want to have a look at, details in here. So when we open it up and start going through the actual section in here, you might see some details down in wheel wells and that, and I want to see if the drawing matches up with the actual parts themselves. So that's another thing to look out for as well, is that, you know, from that point of view, you know, is this a fair representation with the instructions or the actual parts inside the kit as well? So generally I'll just come through and we'll go right the way through these, see how it all goes together fine no problem at all then obviously we look at the markings and the color call outs that are called out in here again i've got a rough idea in my head of what it should be so i'm just checking to make sure it is what it says uh, and that there's nothing blazing obvious like that okay the decals themselves again this is one of these areas where you're looking at decals and things like that you really it's not like it used to be back in the day when i look at them now first of all you look at it as you can see it as well i'm looking across to see how big the carrier film actually is is it huge great big parts or is it quite trimmed up tight you can always tell good decals from bad ones normally the carrier film is like a big splat around the outside and obviously that's going to cause silvering problems so i'm looking at that i'm also looking to see how solid the color is is it a really nice silk printed uh, printed decal or is maybe it is along the lines of printed as in dots and things made up from that okay so again silk screen will always be better and also little things you're just looking out for is registry it used to be a big thing back in the day with actually just you know the registration of the parts and obviously it being laminated and layered up correctly so you don't get white areas um, and like you know the decals are off register and off center things like that the other thing I'm looking out for is obviously when we're looking at things like this is that are they actually words or are they doing generic sort of blurb as I call it a lot of the Far East ones just put tiny little X's and things like that in there or is it actually real words things like that and again making sure that when you tip it onto its side when I do this it's to look to make sure that the actual carrier film is on the printed bit you'd be amazing amount of times you do it and you think that's out of register for whatever reason with the actual layers again that tends to be more the old school kits modern ones don't seem to have the problem and as we can see just down on here these look really very very nice indeed no problem with that again so good strong solid colors good colors right the way through and the actual the lettering is fine and as you know this is 70 seconds so it's probably as small as you're going to get it's all good you know and that's really as simple as that obviously other things you look at is instrument panels so you've got obviously different types down in here with the instrument panels they look a little bit of a weak spot for rice down in here and again the harnesses look a little bit of a weak spot because they are just single colors being put down so it's not as good as a proper uh, photo etched or you know properly bigger scale shall we say uh, decals and things like that so that's the decally bits. Then obviously it is to the sprue. So two things we're looking at, sorry, wrong one. Overall, we're looking at the layout of the parts, making sure it's all nice. Also, you get your first impressions. And I have to say, this is absolutely beautiful. It's got that very nice matte finish, but incredibly smooth uh, actually on the decal. Also, we're looking around to see how the parts all are, making sure all the parts are still on the sprue as well. That's obviously always a bit of a crucial thing to look out for. So generally just having a good look round overall to making sure there's nothing blindingly obvious. Okay, also you're looking for broken parts on here. We're also looking for miss molds. We're looking for sink marks or anything else that could be something to do with the injection molded system. Okay, then we'll move over to the close up ones. Okay, and usually we'll pick out something a nice part and as you can see that's beautiful details down on here and again the luxury i've got is 
uh, my eyesight is getting bad now over the years I think so I've got a big 27 inch monitor with this blown up on it and it's huge so I can see all the details better than the naked eye so again I'm looking out for blemishes we're looking for anything that's wrong we're looking for power lines which perhaps go along and then they just stop and then start perhaps differences in uh, depth uh, and widths of panel lines, things like that. Again, if it's got, so not so much on this scale, but obviously on the bigger scales, riveting detail to making sure that it goes right the way through and it's a good solid uh, riveting right the way through out instead of it being perhaps faded or worn off and things like that, all right? So that's usually the first ones to look for. Then in case it's just looking around at the small parts. So again, we're looking out for ejector pins to see if it's got ejector pins on small parts as well, how they handle ejector Pins. are they anywhere that's going to be an issue or are they going to be tucked away where you're never going to see them okay props especially making sure they're good solid around the outsides of the edges of the props so you haven't got it where it's perhaps feathered off to nothing and obviously you know miss molds and stuff like that because props are prone to it okay on the body always a classic example this type of thing especially is looking at the surface detail obviously you've got the metal and the fabric finish on the hurricane so we're looking to see how that works and how it sort of looks in this scale as well okay also looking at the panel lines on the fuselage does it have actually any detail around them again not so much worried about it on this scale but if you were looking at something perhaps on 48th and then obviously into the 32nd and well 24th you're looking for obviously riveting details perhaps um, you know the actual uh, formers going throughout uh, and obviously latches uh, and locks and things like that for removable panels on the aircraft say 70 second not so much so again looking at those again you're looking to see how the panel lines work as they go around edges and underneath the same goes with here with obviously surface detail how it wraps around is it good or does it fade off till nothing I have to say these are very very nice indeed okay again smaller parts you're just making sure they haven't got any flash attached to them there is quite a lot of flash on the sprues but this is the thing you don't be led by this at all if it's on the sprue that's no problem whatsoever if it's on the part and then obviously if it's just a thin wispy bit on the part no problem at all but if it's a really thick pit on there that you've got a cut off and it could damage the part then obviously that's going to be something you might want to mention in your review stuff like that okay and then generally looking around at it you're also looking at the sprue gates how the sprue gates actually attach to all the parts are they quite big and chunky or actually are they you know very fine um, you know and do it but then again you've got that trade-off it's too thin a part holding it on here it might fall off it could actually get damaged in transport things like that so you want a good enough sprue tab to actually hold the part in place okay let alone just being injection molded it and stuff like that okay again looking around on here you're looking to see if you've got separate control surfaces uh, or they're fixed so obviously you've got the tail planes here look like they're separate but obviously the ailerons on the wings they're fixed all right so you're looking out for things like that and again tops of the wings are beautifully done and obviously you've got the gun area underneath here so you know knowing the hurricane as i do i'm looking to see if it has got the actual latches and they are on here you can see the little silver bits which is really nice indeed very finely detailed in this scale right the way over okay again on the blind side you're looking for internal details is there any around on it obviously on here you have got some locating areas but it's beautifully smooth the molding is actually done in the machine the tooling uh, we often you'll hear me talk about machining and tooling obviously I'm an engineer by trade so I appreciate where they do this type of work on the insides of molds on the blind side some companies they don't polish out the molds quite as much as others this one to be honest is absolutely fantastic okay and again you're looking to see internal details but also like down in here in the cockpit you can see you're looking for ejector pins and again looking initially down in here you've got a little bit of light reflecting off of these these aren't ejector pins it's just where it's slipping out the mold so that's fine but your ejector pins are tucked down out of the way so that's a nice positive mark for this one okay stress fabric you can see down in here is beautifully representation as well no problem at all and again that internal detail we were looking at in the instructions it has got it in here and things like that so that's really what you sort of trying to look at when you're looking around on these and then again it's a, the overall appearance as you look at it just to see if there's anything that, that looks out of place next up obviously we've got various items in here so again you might want to point out to people that this one does come with three different types of spinner for the uh, three different versions okay on this one and again we've got this version because i'm doing the navy one i think it's got a slightly different rudder 
Okay, so you've got that one down in there. And again, things to point out, you've got weight on wheels, which is that thing. Is it just flat or are they actually bulged with the weight of the actual tire on it? And these are bulged and flat, so that's quite a nice touch as well. We've got the seat and the other items, as you can see. And again, on the reverse side, you're just making sure everything looks as good as well, making sure you haven't got any big ejector pins or anything down in these. And that looks very nice as well. So I have to say that gets full kudos to them down in there okay last up and it's always the interesting one as well is the clear part so when you're looking at the clear parts first of all you're just looking at overall clarity and using the grid of the cutting mat you can see how much distortions in it now again 70 second like this you're going to give it some leeway purely because the thickness of the plastic is dictated by the injection molding process so yes it's going to be a bit thicker than real life okay but you're going to have to allow that because if you want to get out injection molding it has to be of a certain thickness but various things you can see this front one which is the one here we're looking at is absolutely fantastic there's a little bit of distortion but not much but again allowing for its scale and the various things you take into account you can see actually they are very nice the other thing as well you might want to point out is how sharp the framework is actually on the clear part. This is the bit of the thing where you think about is that how if you were going to mask it yourself, you could put it on. Would you just put tape over it, push it down, burr it in and then cut it? Or would you have to go in something else? Again, this one is a little bit because of its scale. It's a little bit soft on the edges, so it curves up. So it'd probably be a little bit of a handful. So a mask set, if Matt was here, that's what he would go for. But you might want to think about obviously taping lines in and then doing some filling in the middle on this one just to make it a little bit easier. But again, you've got two types in here uh, as well with the front one. Okay, But generally, all the other parts are absolutely fine. And that is how I do a review. So again, hopefully you can see it's not just a case of looking at some plastic and that's it. There is a little bit of forethought that goes into it. And obviously when I'm looking at the review, I'm in my mind's eye, I'm working out how I'd build it, how I'd go about it. So I'm looking to think, right, well, look, the gear goes on now, why? I'll break it off. Okay, so that might be an issue uh, and things like that. But that goes on then to planning your build, which is something I've done an entire separate video on for around about 10 minutes, me waffling about how I would approach doing a build and what to look out for, things like that. You can go off and see that video. But again, it's one of those things where I don't spot everything. I'm human at the end of the day, and I haven't now got the resources to go out and have you know all the information to say what's wrong with this kit. Also, the big thing is I'm a modeler, not a rivet counter. As you know, if you've been watching me over the last God knows how many weeks we've been doing these live shows, you'll know I'm not the biggest rivet counter. If it looks right, I'm happy. If it, something was wrong, it would be blindingly obvious probably even in this stage if it's if it's the wrong shape or doesn't look like it but looking at it it looks like a hurricane shape to me the wings are fantastic the fuselage looks good looking at all the other areas i have to say they all look very very nice but again if you were looking at it and you're looking at the nose perhaps on especially russian aircraft because certain manufacturers get the nose always wrong you might even look at it doing a review thinking it just doesn't look right okay it might look better when it's on the aircraft but it might be something you want to look out for and then is there an aftermarket route if you wanted to go down that one and things like that and that's the other thing as well if there's aftermarket available and i'm aware of it i'll probably mention it during the review as well and again you might think to yourself well on 70 second scale and as i say instrument de decals they're probably fine in that one harnesses you could probably get away with using the decals as well again if you're moving into the bigger scales and you're coming into the 48th 32nd world if you're looking at and thinking it needs a little something so you might just want to mention that it needs you know a set of fabric harnesses i think look great especially on prop aircraft or you might think to yourself if it's a modern one the ejector seat's a little bit plain and it's something that you'll probably see quite a lot of if you haven't got a pilot figure sat in it that is so an ejector seat might be a good way to go as well so it's one of those ones where you can obviously you know put your opinion over to other people but hopefully if they're in the buying process of buying it they might think well look, i'll get a set of harnesses at the same time for it or i'll get an ejector seat for it at the same time because you're probably right you're probably going to need one and away you go but that's it but these are my own thoughts of looking at it it's all it actually is so sometimes i'll get people and they'll be like oh you missed you should have said this or i've tried to build that kit and it's unbuildable i'm not saying it's unbuildable i'm not saying it's buildable i'm just saying it looks very nice on the plastic 
fantastic and that's what I try and do with the reviews but again it's one of those things where I don't catch everything but if I can and spot it then I'll obviously make people aware of it and again in the past I've seen kits which quite frankly are pretty awful I'm about to build the Mac 2 kit and that thing is truly awful but I always try and put a positive spin on a kit because let's face it at the end of the day you know it's out there it is an option and unless it's a really bad one and the chances are I wouldn't review it if it was that bad you're going to be doing something with it okay and even if it is a bad kit like the Mac 2 one it's your only option so you're going to go with that one aren't you and you're going to have a go with it and do the best you can with it so it's always nice to put a try and put a positive spin on something even if it has got huge problems and let's face it different manufacturers I know that well now to look for as I'm looking at the kit so Tamiya for instance you know full well there's no point really looking for sync marks because there won't be any the actual flash there won't be any but what there will be is ejector pins because Tamiya likes ejector pins they like to get them out of the mold quickly and efficiently so they put a lot more ejector pins in than I think is necessary with a kit so that's the thing as well is when I'm looking at it I'm looking at things thinking where's the ejector pins and I'm looking for them in places where traditionally they are guilty of, but also areas where you don't want them. Classic is the B17 about to start, it's got ejector pins in some really horrible places. You know, you've got them in uh, between detail of Bombay doors and things like that. So you're gonna have to get in there and get rid of those because they're gonna stand out. Inside flaps and things like that, you know, notoriously difficult areas to get in and clean out. Inside wheel wells, those types of areas, you know, Tammy is guilty of all of those and they are a triple A manifest factory when you get other people like wingnut wings always shift them out of the way so there's nowhere that are seen even airfix is doing it these days is trying to move the ejector pins out of the way okay so that's the other thing as well so that's what i'm sort of looking for as you make our way through and again different manufacturers you know they're going to have little things so you tend to look out with those as well but that just comes from doing hundreds and hundreds of reviews and getting used to them but it's really nice to do a review like that because that is the first time i've actually looked in the box so having never seen that hurricane before I have to say as far as I'm concerned sat here that's probably the nicest 70 second hurricane I've ever seen and I know a few of you have actually built it now and have said to me it's gorgeous they are fantastic from my point of view I'd like to build one just to know how well it is but just the plastic look of it itself just on the sprues like this it looks amazing fantastic detail right the way through and that's the type of thing you're looking for you're trying to look at a kit have a look at it and think do you know what that's really nice very good solid strong panel lines all the way through they seem to be in scale as much as it can be because of obviously with the scale that it's in and that's what you're looking for with the reviews you make your way through so there we go that's our review kit hopefully you have a new appreciation of it when i do some more ones so yes anyway um today as i said is going to be a bit of a funny one uh if you guys got any questions whatsoever please post them up as i say i don't know if it's something wrong with our chat or perhaps just no one's in it so uh oh no it's going to kick me out and then try and kick me in again hold on one second as we try and just get across in here and where are we oh no there's a load more in there now so hold on there's a lot more of the actual uh flory clan are in there now as well so uh, if anybody's got any questions, anything else like that, just chuck them in as of now, because I haven't got time and I haven't got the assistance, glamorous assistance to go back up through there. Uh, question, Phil, how do you go about, oh God, everyone's now bloody asking questions. Hold on, slow down everyone. How do you go de deciding which kit to review? normally obviously pm models uh, you know i'm a co-owner me and matt own 50 50 in the company so we will discuss what kits we're getting in uh beforehand usually a long time before we actually get them in uh and then at that point it's just a case of saying right okay well look that's a new line for us like for these we've got all of these in so they've just come in so matt will then say well look which one do you want to review because there's no point reviewing them all because they're all the same because it's all hurricanes so um and he'll send me one down but nowadays i've sort of caught up with a lot of reviews over the years so it tends to be a lot of the newer stuff i'll review as it comes in and again if we get things that are weird and wacky in like the mac 2 kit you know then obviously we'll do things like that that are a little bit left field other things um uh, to be honest good friend of mine john he's fantastic at getting me anything from kitty hawk he's got an in with kitty hawk so uh every time that he gets sent a uh a, i won't go into too much detail because i don't know how much he wants me to tell people but he gets kits put it like that and then what he does fantastically because he only lives 10 minutes down the road 
whizzes them up to me i'll do the review for him and then he has the kit back and normally builds it for very important people so that's what we do with that one so if you're wondering how i get some of the kits before you traditionally see them months and months in advance that's the reason why uh, which is quite nice occasionally i get manufacturers send me kits as well but to be honest that's very very few and far between i um, used to get them years ago lots and lots but these days probably because i speak too loud, too loud and make too much noise um, but yeah so manufacturers not so much these days but uh, used to get them lots and lots uh, phil any issues i'd look out for with the hasagawa a7e corsair 2 okay so this is um it's one of those things the corsair traditionally out of the box actually isn't bad but if you're a bit of a rivet counter people will say that it's got faults and things i'm not so i won't go into those generally it's pretty nice the only thing you have got with all of those families because they've got a giant intake is making it seamless you can see it so you want to make it seamless there's lots of options out there for doing it but again with the corsairs and the crusader family it's one of those things take care of the intake make it seamless get it plumbed in get a nice seal because it's got like a lip system on that one where it sort of pushes in from the, the inside make sure that's all taken care of as well so it is a case of get the filler out sand and fill sand and fill uh, and do it like that but it's one of those ones you just want to make sure it's good uh, going from the rest of it actually it's not too bad at all the crusader is a beautiful kit no no doubt about that at all the corsair is actually fantastic as well and as i say I used to get Ravel did a rebox of it as well uh back over the uh the days uh phil when will the covid bill come to an end i think what we'll do is we'll run the covid bill to the end of the month um to the end of this month I think that's roughly what we do but again it's a very open-ended one i know some of you have like you know got big projects on the go with that so if it rolls on it rolls on i'm not that worried about it let's put it like that we've been having a lot of fun whilst we've been doing these so you know at the end of the day if you've got a big build and it's carrying on we can just keep you know going with it so if we i'll tell you what i'll be we'll do a good one so if we say um at the end of june if we run it to the end of june that would be a nice one because that would be four months then in total so i think that would be pretty much what we do for a standard sig anyway for the four months times uh, do, 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 do. apparently armor hobby do fantastic pictures on their website as well so have a look for those ones as well um where are we uh, do, uh sorry guys all there uh phil eh? oh yeah we've done that one Phil, is the Sanders have arrived? No problem, Andy. Good to see they're there. Nigel says, Phil, uh, where's my little thing? Do you know what? I've lost my little thing here today. I can't remember how we do it now. That's it. Uh, Phil, how accurate is Vallejo model air colours World War II aircraft? Cheers, Nigel. <sighs> I'm definitely the wrong person. I'm usually the biggest outspoken one of colours. To be honest, model air in the old days, and when we say in old days, we're saying over sort of 10 years now used to have some really dodgy color call outs and and some of their ones were pretty much out but vallejo do listen you know and they have fixed a lot of their problems and to be honest with you by the time you've gone through the weathering i think they're absolutely fine um there's always going to be with every paint manufacturer they're going to have a dodgy color because let's face it they all do for some reason or other they all do but generally uh vallejo model air are still i have to say they're my warm and fuzzy paint because I used Vallejo Model Air for, crikey, I'm just trying to think now. Uh, I've been using those since the late 90s. Um, and I used them right up until a couple of years ago when I switched over to lacquers. Um, and they, they just, they work. They just go on. They're fantastic. If you go through any of the live builds and stuff like that, you will see, you know, that's what I used to do with those because it's straightforward. It's easy. Uh, and they go down well. I must admit, I have moved over to lacquers now. Um, but that's just through being lazy because they work and they're easy to use uh phil says a decal question uh with a lot of u.s navy keys uh they have a big bold markings on the tails navy keys that's right i don't get the navy keys they're big bold markings on the tail which seems to join the leading and trailing edges how do you deal with leading trailing edges so normally okay so if you're doing one which one i did it the other week i did it on something the other week but i can't remember what it was now which one did i do it oh, yeah. oh i'll tell you what we did it we did it on the um this little guy on the trojan so 
when you've got a decal and it hangs off the back like this, or even if it was hanging on the front, what I'll do is I will take it so it slightly hangs over, set the decal completely in position and let it dry. So it's literally just hanging past. What you'll notice is if you come in with your setting solution, it will actually stick together on the end. So it usually flattens out and goes off. Once it's there, I sand it off. I don't cut it because many a time I've come down with a knife and then it's, it's ripped it and you end up taking a chunk out of the tail. So what you tend to do is on something like this, you just come along in with a sander. Okay, and then just the medium one and I'll just brush against the grain and then do it on the other side and I've done it on there and we have got a perfect fix. No problem at all with it. it it's worked very, very well. There are we are. So you do get a very good positive trim, you know, so you don't end up tearing any of the back off at all. So literally you just come in and just sand downwards. And the same goes obviously with your leading edges as well. So if you wanted to, you know, come in with the leading edges uh, and you've got a decal that just flaps right over I'll normally just take it a little bit over and just sand them in and away you go I don't do the thing of wrapping it round because the thing is if you overlap two decals together sometimes you get a dark line so if you're dealing with like lighter oranges and obviously with yellows and stuff if you get two going over you're going to end up with like a dark bar so I wouldn't do the thing of like rolling it and just flap it around because it won't really look right and oh my lord you're all on form today um i'll tell you what i've done there i'm gonna to have to turn that off i was actually running two airbrushes earlier let me just take that one down to there and my other airline's got a small leak uh hold on let me grab that phil uh thank you to the guys for the great shows you've been putting us all up uh you're keeping us all sane at home no problem at all it's our pleasure uh, uh, Phil, I've just got her Taka US Air Force, US Navy, and US Marine Corps paint sets. Is the 36118 gunship grey supposed to look slightly purple? Uh, also, I've contacted her Taka as per discussion recently bottle leaks. I think the one reason that some of the paints have leaked is that the lids are screwed on too tightly causing the nozzle to crack uh, to be honest i think that's what it is as well we've said that as well i think their machine does it up too tight um don't forget gunship gray is a little bit purple um and it's one of those strange colors when you first put it down on its own it looks quite purple but when you put it with grays it looks okay i've got it and i've used it and to be honest when i used it i thought that's very purple but once it dries and that it seems to be okay so i won't worry too much about it but I must admit, I know what you mean. When I first put it in my colour cup, it looks purple. Just purple. It doesn't look like anything else at all. So just, uh, yeah, be mindful. But it's all right. It will be fine once it's dried. Uh, Neil says, trying uh, the black extra thin, it doesn't seem to have as good as gap uh, filling capabilities of Tamiya. Did you find the same? I wasn't trying to do gap filling, if that makes sense. To be honest with you, I haven't tried it for gap filling. Um so can't really comment i don't tend to use extra thins for filling for i know what you're trying to do obviously if you've got a gap but extra thin doesn't like doing that you'd be better off with normal uh glues as well um it to be honest i didn't see any difference really between quick set and theirs so yeah i think it's one of those things what you could do if you've got gap filling and you want to do that do use my old trick use a bit of glue you know homemade styrene filler pop that in the hole and then brush extra thin over the top of it and it will dissolve the uh the gloop you know the styrene filler okay and smooth it out as well so if you've got tiny little gaps that's what i would always do uh love this little trojan uh, it's like a mascot for the live shows he is well, that's all what it was, wasn't it? Doing this little guy. I must admit, it was a lot of fun. It seems a long time ago now. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, question. Um, mix Mr. Hobby Aquatus Colour with X20A, about 50-50. Uh, and then went, uh, it went very wet and has dried to a very high gloss finish. Uh, not what I needed. Uh, over thinned or bad airbrush technique okay so don't forget some of the aqua colors are gloss 
they're not all matte. It's not like Tamiya, where the entire XF range is flat and the entire X range is gloss. With the Guns Aquatist stuff, some of it's gloss, some of it's not. If you look on it, it'll say gloss, some of them say semi-gloss, some of them say matte. Okay, so it may be the colour you were putting down um, was a gloss, so that's why you've ended up with a gloss finish. Usual thing though, you can just overcoat it, or if you want to put down a gloss finish as more of a satin finish or flat finish, just bump up the air pressure and move away a bit, and that'll be absolutely fine, you'll be there. But that, if, if you want to, you know, just go over it with a flat coat. Classic example, I think uh, Guns is one. If you get the light gold grey, it's actually a gloss. Whereas obviously everybody else's, it's normally a matte. Technically, it is a gloss. The real one was a gloss, but a lot of companies don't. But if you do it from the, the, the federal standard ones, don't forget, if it starts with a one, it's a gloss. If it's a two, it's a semi. And if it's a three, it's a flat. So that's how they work it with those ones. Uh, well, Neil, that's up to you on that one. Sorry, Neil's just saying it's the tiny gaps to do it. I I must admit, I don't... You, that's more of, I would say, you need to clean up your parts. If you're getting tiny gaps between things, you're putting them together. It might be worth giving them a sand in before you put them together. And then you shouldn't really have them that way. Uh, Richie, question. How about halfway through... Sorry, I'm about halfway through the JU-52 uh, for the action group build. Because I started it early, does it mean that I can't... Yeah, you can't do that. You can't start it. with The grout build isn't till the end of... Well, midsummer. So, no, Richard, you can't do that. You can't start the build early and then just carry on. The whole point of doing it is we will do it all together. You'll have to do something else. Uh, hi, Phil. Just a little reminder. I sent you a couple of buns. Yes, Stefan. Thank you very much for that. I'll get them put up onto the PM store. I'll do that this afternoon after the show. I'll get it in there. Uh, how do you apply Mr. Surfacer 1000? Usual thing, literally, like I've got some 1200 here, I've got some of the others, uh, all the 1000, here it is. So for me, I start off with a 50-50 mix with these, but honestly, I think they can go a bit thinner both in both cases. So I usually go in probably around about 60% self-leveling thinners, or anybody else's, because I have used the rapid dry one with it as well before. And then obviously, do you think, make sure it's had a really, really good mix, okay? And then put it on. Um, to be honest with you, and I will link it up after the show, and it will be a freebie one as well for the guys who aren't members. The raw footage from this lump, okay? It's a, a half hour video, and it shows me priming it and painting it in real time. It's not the edited version. It's just, you can hear me spraying. I'm not saying a lot, because obviously I'm masked up. Uh, but you can see how I put down the primer, and then how we put down white paint okay so that's quite an interesting one. I meant to put it up the other day but I haven't had a chance to do it yet so after the show I will link it in the show notes below here and then I'll go off and I'll put it up onto the social media platforms and stuff like that as well but really it's just a case of dusty coat down first and then you're just going to go in with a nice heavy coat right the way over it okay and then obviously if you're getting near it looking very wet you just move off somewhere else uh, and go through it like that but with those ones I must admit I tend to use especially with this one here I tend to use it a little bit thinner than you would think Okay, so definitely more along the 60% thinners, 40% of that. You'll know if you're using especially the 500 Mr. Surfacer, if you haven't got enough thinners in it, you make cobwebs, which is great for Halloween. And I did it a few years ago and got absolutely bollocked because uh, it uh, took the paint off a lot of stuff. Uh, but yeah, that's the thing. But if you put literally neat Mr. Surfacer 500 in a, through a 0.4 millimeter airbrush, you can make cobwebs. It's great stuff. But yes, don't spray it near woodwork because it will take the paint clean off. Uh, so there we go. Dennis is saying about uh, FS163, that is a gloss. So, because it would have been gloss on the aircraft in the day, I would have thought. So yes, I'm definitely going to have to take care of that hose because it's got a leak. Hold on. Just so happens I was just running a second air hose today. Uh, just take that one off because it will drive me mad and for me to get to the on-off switch is a nightmare so we'll go old school and get it the old way we'll do that and then we'll just go turn that up and weird here's the strange thing 
that my compressor basically goes to 60 psi if it's at 60 psi it doesn't leak if it goes down to 40 psi it leaks so obviously the pressure is holding it open uh, doo -doo -doo. Uh, John says the self leveling thinner gets uh, it to dry quickly and gives a slightly satin sheen again it shouldn't because don't forget it's got a retarder into it if you've got that thing where it's you know you're getting like a flat or more of a satin sheen when you're going for gloss that's normally two things one your air pressure is too high okay so it's physically drying it on route which is obviously all a bad thing and secondly you're not putting enough paint on because what you need is enough paint on the surface for enable it to actually melt into itself okay so that's the trouble if it's hitting it and if the surface is dry it's just going to build up which is great for whites weirdly enough because it's got great coverage but if you want a nice like we've got on here sort of you know a glossy type finish to it really you want it to go along and literally just hit and then melt in and then level out and that's really what the leveling thinner does it enables the particles to hit the surface melt settle flatten out sort themselves all out before it dries and that way you get a nice satin finish as i call it but it's that thing i suppose the the holy grail of all spraying is no matter what coat you're putting down it doesn't matter if it's a gloss or if it's a flat coat the finish of it you want to be totally smooth so you don't want any texture in it now you do want texture at some points because obviously for weathering you need it sticking the surface but for just general paint finish what you're trying to achieve is a nice smooth finish so then that way when you come along with perhaps a clear gloss coat afterwards that will give you that proper mirror look to it okay because that's going to give a nice thick well in, in hobby language a thick coat very nice probably microns okay but you know what i mean so it's got that glassy wet look to it all the time which gives you a gloss finish and then it goes the other way as well so you can have a nice glossy finish but if you put a flat coat over it a bit of distance away higher air pressure particles are drying on route it will give everything a nice flat look because obviously the light can't bounce around because it's got nothing to reflect off of uh, so that's what it is but in all circumstances you want your paintwork to be nice and smooth so when you're rubbing your hand over it it doesn't sound like sandpaper you know you just want to put your hand so it's literally it feels dead smooth you know so there's no texture to it so that way it's like a neutral so you can then go if you want to give it a flat textured finish or you could give it a gloss finish but before that when you're just putting paint down you just want to keep it as neutral as possible but a lot of that comes to your paint mix being right your air pressure being right for the distance and that's why i don't talk about what air pressures i do it just depends on what distance because obviously the further are you away you've got to up your air pressure the closer you are you're going to reduce it okay so obviously you get these people and they talk about oh i spray at 10 psi means absolutely nothing because by the time you take into account the distance they are and obviously their paint mix that will make a world of difference okay then you've got your environmentals of your home and stuff like that as well okay uh get yourself a foot switch foot switch i never turn my compressor off it's literally it's there i think it's all right yeah it's all right it's gonna hold its own now what it is it's just that i've got this <laughs> because i haven't got a mac valve on my other comp on my other airbrush built in so i was using one with a, a mac valve on here so i've just got a little one and i've got twin outlets on my compressor so i have one with this one in and then one with my other airbrush in uh, so that's all that was for it was just so i could literally use two at once because i was being lazy and couldn't be bothered cleaning out my airbrush and uh, where are we uh phil uh is your uh, 2001 discovery finished on your desk it looks a little bit twisted it's, that's just the camera angle i think and plus the fact it's not together look it it all comes apart still so it's literally all like this so nothing's glued it just and the head isn't even put on yet but no it's not quite finished i just finished off all the oil work on it together so it's literally just sat here balanced a little bit like that uh the wood looks straight this so we won't take notes of that because none of it's put together sorry peter and right okay so over into youtube land uh, where are we uh do, 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 do. okay so i'll start at the bottom work my way up has meng purchased display i see exactly the same no they're still separate companies but meng's just getting to have them brand their items and charge more money for it so you can get just the display cutters and then meng has them done and then obviously they're just paying to have them branded so they'll just put meng written on to be honest we could do the same thing 
So they'll they'll do it for anybody. So it's just that thing, and it's no different from the Infini cutting boards. This was obviously from Infini. Now they call them Meng. So you can just buy them without the actual branding. Uh, <laughs> I I will do the uh, negative messages another day when I get them all together. So, uh, but I will do them because they're quite funny. Because I find them funny. Uh, hi Phil, a question. I was wondering uh, if you're going uh, to be a live show this Saturday night. The reason I ask is because Saturday night shows have become very popular in terms of viewers here on YouTube. Yeah, to be honest, my partner, as you know, she uh, works in A&E at the hospital and it was her first Saturday off since the outbreak happened. So that's why I must admit I did have Saturday off. Um, I will find out what shift she's on because I don't know her bad partner uh, I'll find out what she's actually doing on Saturday and if she's working then we can but normally she works so that's why I do it but that was the one but uh, in her defense it was her first full day off and everything so uh, that's why we decided to take the day off on Saturday uh, Phil what's your MiG-23 build help me build mine a lot cheers for that I'm a newbie in washing and was wondering what brand you suggest to apply uh, so I can use the Flory wash if you're on about the clear coat going on anything literally whatever you're if you're new and you're using one and you're getting on with it absolutely but it doesn't matter if it's clear so we used to use clear back in the day that does look twisted on there but it's not that's actually level i'm just looking at your camera i can understand what you're saying now because it looks like it's twisted but it's actually not so that's level but on there it looks like it's twisted anyway sorry um yeah so clear coat whatever you're using but if you use clear you used to use it all the time clear but normally anything but if you are new to using the washes and to the hobby i highly suggest using a clear coat purely because it protects everything on here like this thing i didn't i just chucked the wash straight over the top um, but the thing is again it's that thing about texture if your paint texture is really rough and if you're new chances are it might be because that's basic you know it's just that learning curve all right then putting a clear coat down that will stop all of that as well so it makes the wash easy on and off as well so it's very straightforward to do it on that one but literally anything you like remember first couple of times with the wash um, use it over a gloss finish just so you get used to it then as you get used to it like on here we had flat in the middle and everything else so you can use it because you'll know how to get it off and how much you can get off and how much you'll be left and various things like that but definitely to start with always use a, um, a clear coat just to protect everything uh, I've used Hataka lacquer paints on my last uh, build uh have you had issues with masking tape peeling off uh using a little bit of time yet to be honest with you i did but that's through me not priming so if i don't know if you've primed i'm a great believer in priming even though i don't do it a lot myself but if you've watched our live shows even in the past before these ones you'll know me and the guys did phantoms years ago the airfix phantom when it first came out we all built it we all did it on the live one and i unmasked it and went straight down to plastic and that was Hataka lacquers and because it didn't have any primer on it so it was straight down to the plastic so again priming is an absolute must I think with everything it's one of those steps where it's easy to you know think you don't need it you know but it's twofold don't forget priming shows you what you're going to get so it looks bad in primer it'll look bad in paint but also making sure the primer has gone on and it's down will be then the grip it's going to hold on to your paint and also it means you'll need less paint because this thing had gray primer on it but i still only use just under 10 mil of paint to paint the entire thing of that which actually i didn't think i was going when you think about all the internals all those pods each one individually as well 60 pods on there you didn't it wasn't too bad at all so that's fine Phil, do Tamiya paints smell to, uh, to high heaven? Okay, this is one of those ones we spoke about the other day as well. It's If you're on about the lacquer ones, if you've never used them before, yes, they do. But I've become nose blind. Um, so basically, because I use Tamiya lacquers all the time now, to me, they don't smell any worse than anybody else's. Classic example, you might remember a couple of years ago, I had a really long holiday and I was off for a whole month, yeah? So when I came back, it was a case of, Tamiya extra thin stunk to me and that's because I haven't used it for a month so it was that thing you sort of open up a bottle you're like whoa that's really strong I'll tell you what classic example contact to your glue that never was on my radar for smelling but actually I used it a little bit earlier today and thought God, it's quite strong that 
But again, I, I don't think it's got anything to do with it. I think it's just the receptors in your nose, check me out being technical, are getting really sensitive to certain smells when you're not used to it. So again, I think it'd be one of those things, if you go out and buy the lacquer range and you spray it for the first time, you will think, my God, that stinks. Um, but a couple of months down the line, you won't even notice it. Classic example is I did the yellow crepe van, you might remember, uh, the Ebro van, uh, when this lot first came out to about two or three years ago now. And uh, yeah, it was one of those, when I first sprayed it, it was like, wow, that stinks. I mean, proper stinks. And I was telling everybody, because they weren't available in the UK then. And I was saying, they're great paints, but Jesus, they stink. Now, I don't even notice it. So I think it's one of those things. You do generally get used to them all. And, uh, question, Phil, what is the difference in the hurricane from uh, the armor uh, is there a standard uh, and a expert? I don't know, is there? I thought they were all just the same kits, just different boxing. Perhaps they've changed the boxing. I must admit, I tell you, I'm not up on that one. Feel free to comment up if anybody knows the history of them. This is the thing I'm saying. I look at it, I know nothing about it at all, but what I'll probably end up doing now is popping over to scale mates, find out if it isn't, if it is. I take it it's their own because I haven't seen this sprue before. It's the sprue layout with these, it's they got the legs. So the whole point is that these interlock to each other. So when they've got a stack of sprues before they get boxed, they don't rub, which is a very nice touch. Um, and again, so I haven't seen that with another manufacturer. This has got it on here as well. So that's why I, have, I don't think it's a rebox of somebody else's because I haven't seen that uh, type before. Uh, what would you recommend for 135th scale Meng Rifield model? Uh, which would you... Sorry, plain. Uh, 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 build would you do that you haven't already done? Uh, classic example, I intend to build a... Um, I want to do, well, again, the Rifield Challenge has just come out and it does look very nice. And we got them on pre-order with the PM store. So I must admit, I have got my eye on one of them to do a review and then I'll probably just keep it and then build it. Um, but the thing is, I've also got down there, we spoke about it before, got the Meng uh, Abrams Tusk 2. And obviously, Rifield bring one out as well. Now, Rifield do one with the full interior. I'm not worried so much about the full interior. So in some ways, I might just go along and do the Meng one. So I really just want to do the weathering and the bits and pieces and get into it like that. But Ryfield and Meng, if I had a gun to my head, I would say Ryfield models are slightly nicer than Meng, but it's not that much in it. But Ryfield tend to put their details in their internals and stuff like that. But there again, Meng do some beautiful stuff on the inside. I did their King Tiger and it's amazing. It's fantastic. I don't think there's too much between them, but I haven't built a Ryfield models kit yet. And that's what I want to do. I want to build one just to see how well it goes together and how uh, uh, nice it is. Tom says he's just got the wife into model making. Good on you. There's no chance of me getting mine in. <laughs> uh, who makes the best coverage for yellow? Uh, again, anybody, really. Yellow is one of those colours. Don't forget, it's a very strong pigment because yellow is lethal because it, it, it's one of the strongest pigments in nature. But for covering point of view, just put it uh, put white down first. So spray white primer or just a white coat, then put the yellow on purely because yellow is a very um, sensitive air, a color. So if it's got anything dark underneath, you need to lighten it up. So it's always best to put it down. To be honest, LPA, again, going back to the crep van, it's what I did, I use this stuff, and it is absolutely fantastic. It covers amazingly, and it's total gloss finish, okay? But again, Tammy's XF3, you know, again, I know it's old school, but Tammy XF2, XF3, you know, and even XF7, uh, to be honest, XF8 for blue, they are the primary type colours that you use and I will just go for time of time because they cover, they just work for me, okay? And I have got down here, them in lacquers as well, but again, sometimes it's just nice to do what you know and what you trust. So like when I did this one, I have the option to do it in lacquers or do it in Tamiya's XF2. I had tons of XF2, so I thought we'll do it in that one. But again, a lot of that is in my mind, I know I'm safe with it. I know how it works. I know how to use it. Yet if we'd use perhaps the lacquers, I would have to be a little bit more, right, how's it going down? Think about it a little bit more. Uh, 
Brian says he's working on the Tamiya Mercedes AMG GT3 and adding the photo edge details at the moment. Uh, glad to have the Optivisor. <laughs> Absolutely. Lovely kit as well. Great kit. Hi Phil. Great live how-to review. It's weird seeing uh, you on your own today. Ha -ha. Uh, will you be reviewing the 144 Arc Models Braun? I can never pronounce it. I do call it Braun. But it's not, is it? It's Brian or whatever. It's Brian. Brian. That's the one. Space shuttle. I bought one. To be honest with you, I thought about doing it because obviously I've got the seventy-second shuttle up there. We did the big one. Um, but yes, probably it's the type of thing we might get in and do a review of it because it, it's quite a nice one to do. Uh, where are we? Uh, I think we're all up to date on there. Uh, da -da. Uh, the Airfix Hurricane is very nice indeed, I have to say. The guys mentioning about that one, I've built it as well. Uh, is this us just getting a masterclass of Phil reviewing kit because Phil is about to give up doing it? What, giving up modelling or reviewing kits? No, not at all. I just thought it'd be an interesting thing for you guys to see how I go about my thought process of seeing how I go about doing reviews and what I look out for. Uh, good afternoon, Phil. Uh, hero of scale modern world. I don't think so. Uh, aside from the size difference for the Tamiya 48 scale zero, as good as the 32nd. To be honest with you, I've built, I've built the 48 scale one. I haven't built the 32nd one. That's why I've got it here. The 48 scale one is a beautiful little kit. It goes together really, really nicely. Um, but as I say, I haven't built the 32nd one yet. I'll be doing it later in the year and putting my usual kicks and touch and finishes to it. Um, it looks fantastic straight out of the box. So I did the review. I actually, I was really excited about doing it. So, um, and being Tammy, you know it's going to be good. It will go together really well. Uh, apparently, the only thing you do have to watch for is that undercarriage. It's got that key system for everybody I know has built it. It's broken it. They said, do not touch it. If you have it in a position, leave it. It's not like when they switched over to the Spitfire fire and then the mustang where it's interchangeable and they used a lot of the magnet business this one has a habit of snapping off when you try and do it and that's just because everybody i know who's, who's done it has broken it okay so uh where are we uh right let me just pop back over hold on just popping over guys don't try and talk to me through the instant chat because yeah go through the chat room if you can guys because i have like bad enough trying to do two at once let alone three okay so uh right where are we uh we're going to a question for phil uh have you noticed pilot figures uh come in odd sizes uh you would think 48 scale means the pilot would be in the same proportions the size yeah it seems that most are oversized for the cockpit uh you'd want them to fit the usual yeah well we had that recently when i tried the mig 23 which is over in the cabinet these days my pilot figure was like the lurch there was no way he was going to fit in i swear he was at least i reckon he was 1 30th scale or something there was no way uh phil uh, good afternoon all when using dark dirt wash as a pin wash i think you mentioned about adding a touch of vallejo airbrush cleaner uh, to aid flow is this correct if you're just using it as a pin wash okay you're better off just putting it on just put a gloss coat down and then use it the only time you want to do it to make it flow very very nicely is if you've got no intention of trying to wipe it off afterwards so by that i mean like raised detail because on here the reason that we used a tiny little bit of airbrush cleaner in this is to make it really grip i mean all the tiny details because i wasn't going to be able to wipe it off so what it is you actually thin down the wash a lot more and the uh, airbrush cleaner has got a little bit of thinners in it and it will make it really grip to it so the only time i would recommend that is really on raised details if it's recessed details just literally pop a gloss coat on and just put the wash on as normal and you'll be absolutely fine the trouble that you have if you over thin the wash because it's clay particles and although the particles are very very small they're not as small as you find in paint 
by their nature because of its clay particles there you know it's soil at the end of the day okay so they've only got a finite size of going down to smaller so it just for pin washes i highly recommend just stick a gloss coat down and just put the wash right over the top it doesn't matter it's really really thick just chuck it all over it you'll be absolutely fine uh, uh hold on let me grab that uh hi phil i've got the uh hydrogen steam back uh it's uh fpc which i remember is fine precision control valve for the infinity however uh although tightly installed i feel that there's air uh coming out of the airbrush of the hand of the range also the size right i go on. hold on let me get my because uh, there's a story to this hold on which one's mine okay so the fine controller hold on where are we is this bit at the bottom okay now what this actually is it's an add-on i wonder if i can get this off oh god it's not gonna go hold on can't get it off hold on there we go see excellent tool <laughs> Okay, so this is this bit here. Normally what happens is you have a normal air stem, which I don't have an original, which is here somewhere. Here it is. Normally, this is the standard air stem, and this is the PFC or precision fine control airflow. What this actually is, this one is the one that normally goes up in here, and then this bit comes off the bottom. Okay, what you do is you basically, it's an aftermarket part which costs a small kidney, okay, and you have this one, and then obviously this one here goes from, I think it is 30 to 100% air. Now, the big thing is, when I used to be, and to be honest, I say used to because I have no contact with H&S anymore, I used to know one of their guys over there, Warwick, really nice guy, okay, and he asked me for some feedback, which I thought was nice of him very risky okay on this well the airbrush as a whole and this is going back now what three four years so anyway first thing i said to him was is that your nozzles are rubbish because they're too soft an alloy you need to improve that secondly can we have an easy way of identifying the needles and nozzles because again they're a nightmare and thirdly your fine controller needs to go from instead of 30 percent air to 100 it needs to go to naught to 100 because most of us actually want our MAC valves for that first 20%, not the rest of it, because it's you, you need the fine control at the very lower air pressure end. Okay, so that's what it was. So the idea being is, is that you turn this up and off and you can adjust the actual airflow in here. All right, so I'm happy to report they now do a new alloy at the front. They need to do a new system for identifying all the parts and also their new fine precision controller which i believe is available although they've never told me anything and they never sent me anything in my life uh does now go from naught to 100 because they've told me it has but i've never seen one they did tell me they were going to send me one but i've never had it so uh and that's it so that's actually how it actually is if you're getting air at the top what that can actually be is when you're unscrewing it you're actually unscrewing the entire body so as you're sort of coming like this, what you're actually doing is undoing this bit instead of the top half. So the whole point is what you want to do is make sure that this is up in here. Now, a lot of people will say, grab yourself a spanner. And the idea is if you see on here, you've got the flat parts and then your flat bit, you can actually put a spanner on this to tighten this up. But be very careful because if you squash the little o-ring at the top here which even though it's a teflon one okay on here it will actually squash and it can impede your trigger so the trigger doesn't push up and down or if it does it comes up really slowly and that's because this is too tight but what you that's all you're doing is when you're doing it when you're unscrewing if you watch the bit down the bottom here as you unscrew it you come all the way then all of a sudden you see you've turned it that will allow air at the top now because you've got a gap so you can try and tighten that up a little bit, but honestly, I wouldn't overdo it. But the chances are, just when you finish doing it, you've just slightly, you've come to here and you've just unscrewed it. Then you get air coming up. So it may be the case that when you're fully tightened up, just give it a bit of a go, but, and then undo. But it is, to be honest, it's not the best design in the world. 
if you're asking me what to do I would not pay for one of these I think they're incredibly a lot of money and I was really upset when I first got it and it went from 20% to 100 I might have well asked the cat so you are far better off getting one with one of these which does go from 0 to 100 and it's very fine as well as in you have to turn that quite a bit I am that bad okay so you have to turn that quite a bit to get a difference in it yet yeah, that is really all or nothing still and again if you're on a bit of a budget like I always say you're far better off there it is, buying one of these okay because the great thing about this is this now goes with you with every airbrush you got so if you wanted to I could just put this on this okay but you can take this and put it onto any airbrush you want because all it needs is a quick release adapter okay and you've got there from naught to 100 even though this still isn't the best one in the world but you get better ones but this one you'll pay around about 20 quid but it'll last you an entire lifetime and as many airbrushes as you ever own in your lifetime whereas this one of course I can't change this easily because I'd have to take off the entire body and actually come along like this and if I wanted to change it to another airbrush I'd have to take this part off which is sort of defeating the object really because it's not exactly quick release and probably end up breaking it moving it around and stuff like that so it's far better to do it but uh, to be honest with you I think it's overpriced it's very expensive for what that is you're better off spending I think that's like 30 quid and you get one of these for about 18 20 quid uh, and you can do it that way then and at least you can use it a hundred times over so yes there we go so that's what your leak will be and uh, where are we uh question thank you for the washing answer phil one more from me i'm currently doing the 148 scale hasegawa fr sorry fgr2 uh, and want to model it as an early uh, REF camo example of 19 squadrons markings. I can't find these decals anywhere. Hannons don't have them, which surprises me. I thought extra decals did them. Uh, and haven't got any manufacturer that does any suggestion to be gratefully received. Ooh. To be honest with you, I thought extra decals did them. I'm surprised there isn't one out there just trying to think I can't think of anybody um, off the top of my head again anybody's got any questions or any answers shout them out in the uh, chats guys and it'll help out another modeler because I can't think of one off the top of my head um, but I've, I've got to fuck I'm, I would love to say because uh, to try and me and find that picture was a long time ago but I'm sure I did a 19 squadron one can't remember where the decals came from. I've got a feeling it was a commission. There might have been supplied decals. I have to check on that one. Uh, can I put GX100 or GX114 thinned with, oh God, uh, with uh, leveling thinners? God, the guy's now. All right, hold on. Answer that question in a minute. Uh, with Vallejo Model Air safely. Okay. Um, Job model air is basically a uh, like a it's got a polymer or polyurethane in its paint um, and the trouble is that the alcohol based ones of the world like the guns the Tamiya things like that don't and they don't actually like each other very much that's not to say I haven't mixed them because clearly I have but I wouldn't like to um, I wouldn't like to say I haven't done it for a long time to be honest to be mixing those things around um, yeah I, I would think that you're probably okay to try I would try it in a color cup see how you get on with it into a little mixing cup see how they go I to be honest with you I've mixed lots of things with it and never really had a problem with it but I know some people have um, to have a look at that one uh, do, 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 do. Model Alliance, there we go. Have you tried Model Alliance? That's another good one. They do lots of it. And uh, question: Do you have a brand name for the Mac valve? Not for that one, to be honest. I haven't. It's I can't even remember whose it was. This thing I've had, to be honest, I've got a few. I sent one up to Nathan the other day, um, but I've had them for years, absolute years. Well, I got a load of stuff in when I first started doing the airbrushing courses, like four or five years ago. I needed a load of hose and connectors and various things and I sort of bulk 
bought a loads. We used to have four airbrushing stations around here for the courses and stuff like that. So that happens to be one of them. So, but I can't remember where it came from now. I, I have a feeling it was either from Everything Airbrush. Have a look with those. I'm sure it might be those. And um, yeah, a lot of you are pointing out here that uh, uh, that. Um, let me click on it. Uh, decal Phantoms. Who is it? Extra Decal. They do some uh, various schemes. Yeah, Extra Decal. I thought Extra. They were Extra Decals I used, but the guys are shouting out Extra Decal in there and a few others. Uh, you know what that is. Uh, Hans uh, bought all of the model alliance decals before they went bust. Ah, right, there you go. So check in there then, guys. Uh, right, what have we got? Um, hold on. Hold on, everyone stop a minute. Uh, question, Phil, any chance you can show us, uh, me, the consistency of sprue goo? Uh, I made some and it looks a little bit wet. To be honest, watch the photo because mine, I do believe, are both a little bit thick at the moment. Let me, yeah, that's very, very thick. Let me see this one. There we go. Look, well, look, I'll show you what I've got and then you can. So this is my normal one. Okay, you can see it's just about to drip off. There we go. It's I say it's a bit tricky to try and show you, but this is probably to the consistency of like PVA glue. That's probably the, the easiest way. You can see it doesn't drip off, but it will do after a set amount of time. Watch this is where I make a right mess of this. Okay. But yes, so it is a. It's like that. Okay, this one over here, to be honest, this is my thicker one. This is really, that's too thick. You see how it's got candles hanging off of it? That's too thick in theory. So that needs a little bit of thinning out. You can see, look, it's actually gone a little bit thick. But what I do is I have one that's a little bit wetter than the other one, shall we say? And that's what I do for it. But obviously, if you have a look at the video, that's when I made them up fresh. That's probably how they should be. That's what I would go for. Uh, Andrew says, hi Phil, the sanders and washes arrive safely via HMS Endeavour. All right, cool, that's a good job. Very nice, nicely they're all getting through there. Uh, I don't think x do an early 19 squadron. Uh, right, perhaps they did the, oh, is it the green grey ski? Hmm. Uh, Phil, are you able to post sanders during this mess? Uh, yes, we are back open. The store's back open. Although, unfortunately, guys, we are out of dark dirt. I didn't want to mention it before because we were down to 100 bottles last week. Um, but the thing is, the pigment, uh, the factory's closed uh, and it's not even in the UK. So I am waiting for them to be reopened. I have been told, and again, I, I say this very, very loosely, I've been told to I should get delivery on the 23rd. Bearing in mind, it was due in on the 18th of March. So, but I do believe they've gone back to work. They went back last week. So I'm hoping this means it's still gonna come in uh, and then we'll have dark dirt back in stock. But at the moment, dark, start, dark dirt is out of stock. We've got all the others, trust me, we've got thousands of the others, but dark dirt is our most popular one. And the pigment, we it was on order. It should have come in on March and now we've just run out. So yeah, it's a little bit back. But yes, it's all back out there now. Bill, uh, where are we? Oh, uh, that's all right, that's that one. Right, okay, let me pop over to, uh, back into here. Okay, uh, what is the difference between Mr. Color 4000 filler and self-leveling uh, and their Aquatus line? Okay, they are all the same. Uh, the 400 just means how many mils in a bottle. So it's 400 mil in a bottle. That's all the 400 mil is. That's why they do one, I think 200 or 250. Okay, self-leveling thinners, which gets pointed out to me all the time, isn't self-leveling thinners, because it doesn't do it on its own. But I like it, it's a nice word. Anyway, um, leveling thinners is this one here. This is the one which is great, because it's got a retarder. All it is is a retarder. No different from car painting, because car painting, there's different grades of thinner. It's just the same here. So actually, I haven't got the normal one, but they do a rapid, a normal, which to be honest, is exactly the same 
as X28 and a normal one, okay, and a lacquer one. So these are two lacquer ones, and again, they do an acrylic one called the Aquatus range, which is exactly the same as X28 uh, as well. So that's it. But you can use lacquer thinners in anything that's got a flammable label on it. So like guns, it's alcohol-based. It's not a true acrylic. So is Tamiya, and it's great for those. They absolutely love it. Uh, question, manufactured with the best modern aircraft colours, uh, acrylics or lacquer? Okay, uh, if you're thinking of acrylics, then um, I would have to say guns, aquatus stuff is absolutely, you've got all your colours you could ever want pretty much through them all. Lacquers, I do like Hataka lacquers, I've been using them now pretty much for everything, but they're not without their problems, I'll, just, I'll be honest with you. Um, some of their colours are a little bit odd. Um, for instance, I use their Insignia White and it's more like Magnolia. So I ended up going back down and using just normal XF2 and then sticking a little bit of buff in it. Um, so yeah, they're not perfect all the way through, but I think they give a really nice, good, natural colour right the way through. And I've been using their stuff now for the last over a year uh, and they're very nice at that. They work really, really well. Uh, um, hi Phil, uh, I've had a lot of first-hand knowledge of the Tornado aircraft, sorry, I have a lot of first-hand knowledge of the Tornado aircraft uh, and no undercarriage uh, bay upgrade kit is correct for the 132nd scale. Do you think there'll be much a demand for an upgrade kit for this scale? Um, I, to be honest with you, don't forget we've got a new one coming out. Now, I know obviously uh, Italeri, we don't know, we've only seen the CAD work yet, but obviously that I think is going to supersede the old Rebel one, the old Rebel 32nd one. But again, it may be one of those weird cases, because I think they're doing the GR4, isn't it, or something? Um, it may be a little bit uh, different versions, different variants, it still has its own place. But would there be a, a a thing for it i don't know 30 seconds always an odd scale because it's a big scale 48th if you were playing around with something like that there might be a lot because to be honest there seems to be hundreds of them have been built on our forum at the moment uh phil do you know of a good 148 scale hell diver out there uh that will be the uh, isn't it the accurate miniatures one which is reboxed by Italeri? Again, I'm struggling here. I need my cohorts with me. Um, but yeah, might be an idea to. I'm pretty sure they did the Hell Diver. Not, I'm not 100% on that one. Just have a look. But the accurate miniatures one was actually very nice, if I remember rightly. And I'm pretty sure Italeri reboxed it last year. So. Uh, yeah, I love the thing about that. I'll get used to the smell, but I bet the wife probably won't. That's yeah, I can relate to that. Uh, um, I'm working back up through the uh, thing in here. Rebel contactor smell is what drove me back to modeling 20 years ago. <laughs> uh, it's a bit weird, I must admit. You get these smells and things like that. Occasionally I'll get a new product in and that's always funny because the first thing you do is sniff it. It's like why why do you do that? I, I think it's it's a modeler thing. It's a bit like if you're a modeler and somebody says to you Oh, I've got got a new brand of paint and The first thing we do as modelers is sniff it instead of thinking got good colors got good pigment I wonder what the coverage like no as a modeler you go. Yeah, that'd be good. That'd be right It's got a good strong smell. It'd be fine um, What else we got? I uh, just ordered a Mac valve. There you go. Mac valves will be selling out across the land right now. And they'll be wondering why. Why have I just sold my entire stock of Mac valves? Uh, won't switch to lacquer paints until the day they make the modelists. Well, Gordon, you've got a long wait because it'll never happen. Like most things in life, if it smells right, it is right. Uh, uh, uh regarding acrylic paints do you have a specific brand or specific uh effects look i think at the end of the day is that paint is all to do with coverage and ease of use being honest um at the end of the day if the color's not quite right as you've probably guessed over the last few weeks i don't really care 
uh, because I'm more into the weathering and doing the bits to it. So it's it's one of those things. It's a bit difficult to show on anything that I've got here at the moment. But you get slightly. There we go. That'll be a good one. Mm. There you go. For you guys who watch me live, this is when I did the live one day jobby and we did this one as a paint job. So classic example, Russian colours are notoriously difficult to get right. And manufacturers have been playing with Russian shades of, you know, flanker colours especially since, you know, time began. The difference, or I suppose the difficulty is for the manufacturers is to pinpoint a colour that is correct in the first point because flankers notoriously weather incredibly quickly they have a really hard life you know they're out in the elements they're big aircraft you know um so they tend to fade and they weather in and stuff like that so at what point as a manufacturer of a paint do you think that's the shade i'm going to go for when if it's a brand new color chip and it's just come off the production line to be honest it'll look a bit corgi fired as i call it a bit sort of toyish so you want it to have a more weathered look but at what point do you call it that that is the color because you can't and that's the point so it's very very difficult to think you know does that look right and again it's one of those things of compromises because you've got the scale effect of your model and the various things to it and you've got other colors and a classic example is the green on here because until the green goes on this it looks too grayy bluey then you put the contrast color in like the green and actually you think oh that actually looks quite nice it's quite a smart color that and it takes that green color to make the other colors look correct and that happens many many times you know we were talking earlier about the gunship gray with the attacker one that's quite purple it does until you put the gray with it and then it sort of looks okay but in the color cup it looks purple uh, but once it's on actually it looks okay so you think when i did the b52 classic example i thought it was going to come out looking like barney the bloody bear by the time i've finished it but actually it doesn't it looks fine once you get in there but that has no contrast color so it's very difficult for it to offset against it but you know this is the thing at the end of the day you can go through and each manufacturer has their own interpretation on what they think is correct so in some ways i think it's unfair where people sort of blame a manufacturer say all oh, that color's completely wrong or it's nothing like it or anything else like that because it depends what references they've gone from you know have they gone from the official color chip and if they have I think from a scale point of view it wouldn't be right anyway it's going to look too dark also you've got this other thing we spoke about before if it's a gloss it will always be darker if it's a, a flat it will always be slightly lighter so the manufacturer has to allow for that during the their paint process of what version they're going for um, so if you're going for mrp their paints always tend to be quite glossy so they have to obviously backscale it a little bit to make them a little bit lighter to allow for that um, so and that's not an easy thing to do so again it's one of those ones where there's a lot of uh you know what you think's right might be uh, not everyone's sort of thing for it so i'm more in kin to think of look that's the ballpark that's where i'm going to start and then because i'm going to come in with weathering which normally in my case will be a wash of some description so that will darken it then i'll probably come back in with oils and stuff that might darken it a little bit more so i'm always probably more inclined for my mixes to add a little bit more white uh, or a little bit more grey or buff or whatever colour it is into it to lighten it a bit because I know I'm going to be going darker with pretty much every one and because I don't do this thing of like flat coating when I've finished I'm not going to go back up a, perhaps a couple of octaves <laughs> you know on this you're not going to go through the, the shades like that purely because I don't have that effect and mine tends to always have I, don't, I like my models to have that sort of three-dimensional look to the paintwork so even on this one my heart is saying leave it my head is saying you need to flat coat right over it to knock it down a couple more shades it's too bright but i like the way the light reflects just off of various areas on this one um, and it makes the model to me a little bit more three-dimensional i played with it a lot for years trying to get it right with the a10 uh, and that came to fruition when i decided this time i'm not going to give it a flat coat i'm actually going to sand it so i actually sanded it with a very fine sandpaper to give it a more flat and satin look and then we polished some areas to give a more glossy look to try and get that natural look to aircraft instead of them being flat uh, and that's something that i've done ever since let me move that before i ah, run out of room okay uh let me just switch back switch back to chat room uh do, do, do. phil question uh i use micro sole on decals and let them dry overnight the problem is now that i can't get rid of the wrinkling any thoughts 
give it another coat. Normally it will sort itself out. The wrinkling is normally this effect where it comes in. The only thing that can happen is if it wrinkles a little bit too much, it pinches on itself. So it sort of does this and then it gets stuck. So it might be a case of just give it another one. But again, very thin coats, very, very thin coats. If that doesn't work, give it a coat of X20A acrylic, not lacquer, acrylic X20A. Give that a coat of it and see if that'll do the trick. Because if that won't bury it, nothing will. And uh, do, 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 uh, where I Phil, what? Uh, sorry, Phil, where is the discovery going to live? To be honest, I've got that shelf at the back there and it's going to fit in there. But at some point, obviously, between now and I can ever get up there, bearing in mind I've been up there for seven months, it will go up to Doncaster, it'll go up to the showroom um, for its first bit of its life. I intend to go up there when I can get up there and bring back the bombers. So the B-52 will come back and the bear, because they're going to hang up on the wall. And then I will go up and I will take up things like the Hornet, the F-18, all the ones we've done recently, the MiG, a lot more of the little ones, because the bombers are taking up so much room up there. So it's probably better to bring back some of the big stuff and replace it with some of the small. So I might pay, take the Sabre up there. We'll take up the book missile system, um, the Sopwith Camel, things like that. The Gladiator can go up. So that will clear my shelf. And then perhaps it will live in there and then it will go up and it will rotate with the others. Or, to be honest, a lot of you have seen it, but my um, uh, office upstairs, I've got all the Star Wars stuff. So like the Millennium Falcons up there and all my Star Wars stuff and everything. It will probably fit in there. It's more like sci-fi up there. So I might stick it in there. Uh, Phil, is the factory closed? Uh, sorry, Phil, is the factory closed that does the pigments? Yes, that's why we're out of pigments as well. It's the same place. They all come out the same place. So it's my pigment uh, manufacturer. They are out. They are closed down. You see. So the pigments. I never. To be honest, we don't share, sell tons and tons of them. So it was that thing where it's just a case of you know I put in orders as and when, and they usually deliver the normal pigments within a week or two weeks of putting in the order. But because of this happened, they literally shut down. But because they're from the on Europe, it comes out of Europe. They're on the continent, so they shut down before we did. And to be honest, I took my eye off the ball. But my, I did have a pre-order already in for the dark dirt. But um, again, it's one of those things. But as soon as it's all in, I'm sort of hoping. Um, tomorrow morning I'm going to be um, making a few phone calls to my manufacturers to find out one when the sanders will be back in because we are starting to get a little low on some of them right for the moment but we will be getting low and then uh, obviously I need to find out about other things as well so bottles lids you know tubs jars printing as well got to sort out the printers because um, we're actually running out a lot of that stuff as well so it's that thing normally you know I have a window of around about three months uh, lead on stuff and we're getting near to that now so it's a case of we need to sort some of this out uh, do, 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 do. Uh, hold on let me just go across to here uh, question oh hold on uh, have you checked the real uh, air colors and what do you think to them uh, David no I haven't I've got the armor ones I've got them down here uh, and we used them on the Russian, because I've got all the Russian colours down in here on the book missile system. Absolutely loved them. I think they are great. They've got beautiful coverage. I use them with rapid drying lacquer thinners. Very, very flat finish. That's the only thing. It's fine for me because I've weathered it to hell. But yeah, you probably wouldn't want to put that on an aircraft. And I'm led to believe the aircraft ones aren't quite as flat. Um, so hopefully they'll be a little bit nicer. But I would like to get a few in and we'll have a play with those. Uh, do, 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 do. uh spec to a guy who owns uh, the last model shop in my town this weekend sounds like it'll be closing sad very very sad trust me if i had my way i'd open up a model shop in every town <laughs> uh phil what is the best in terms of construction and detail for an f15 in 148 scale um you ever did uh you built uh the hasagawa f15e uh and it was marvelous i tried the academy one and had some problems with the intakes okay a little bit right wing on this but the hasagawa f15e i didn't like at all because all it is is a b with an upgrade bit on it um, for a strike eagle, the mud hen, to be honest with you, you've got two options. Um, obviously, you've got Revels, which is actually one of Revels' best kits. 
um, it's great with that and their Rafale it, they are beautiful aircraft they go together really really well no problems at all but both of them are sort of showing their age a little bit now um, and they have been superseded by Great War Hobbies so Great War Hobbies now bring out the line of F-15s so they do the C they do was it the A uh, they do the B, D and the A, C versions and they do the E um, but again apparently they are a little bit of a handful but from a detail point of view I think although you've got that situation where they're a little bit of a handful to go together and might need a little bit more work the detail that you get with those kits is worth the extra work needed because the trouble is if you're going down the Ravel one it's not as detailed so you, you're into that situation better detail overall but it's a little bit more of a handful less detail but it goes together again it's very difficult it depends where you want to put your money on that one and go through it um, but again the Great War Hobbies kits everybody I know has built them first of all they say they're amazing they're fantastic then they run into fit issues but if you push through it everyone says it's well worth the extra the uh, help and you know the little bit of trouble with it uh, thanks Phil for clarifying that uh, see you on tomorrow on Thursday show maybe Saturday show yes we will definitely and there we go that's it because now I'm being handed by the dogs so yes thank you very much for joining me today me and Matt will be back on with you tomorrow as well so I'm not sure because uh, if it'll be two or three so keep an eye on social media and all the bits and pieces uh, for that one don't forget to like and subscribe and that and you'll be updated to when we are on we'll be back on with you again on Thursday night and then as I say we'll be back on on uh, Friday for the roundup show not sure if it'll be live or recorded whichever way we go uh, but as I say things are starting to get back to normal now so we'll see how these things all plan out but thank you very much for joining us this afternoon it has been a pleasure as always hopefully you got a little bit of something out of it and we will see you all again very very soon so happy modeling take care see you soon bye